Okay, guys, so the second act of the play takes, almost, well, te entirely takes place in um, Jack Worthing's manor house in the countryside. And it's important to note in terms of theatrical condition, tradition that the country in restoration comedy, which is an enormous source of influence for this particular play, which is often plays of, that were comedies of manners, is the site of purity and the restoration of innate virtue. But this is not the case with Wilde's kind of anti-Wordsworthian satire. You know, Wilde's aestheticism states that style is an, is an important impenetra impenetrable barrier between nature and the artist, and that therefore we, we, we should actually seek to block the natural as a source of um, spiritual wisdom or, or philosophical consolation or virtue. That style is really the only virtue. So what we see then is, is uh, effectively the characters behaving in exactly the same way in both locations, and and actually failing to address any of their human shortcomings on the basis of their location. Now, Miss Prison, which has a number of different connotations. I think the first one, the most obvious one, is the word misprision, which is the technical legal term for effectively sort of legal concealing um, a, a wrongdoing in, in law. And what that obviously relates to is her neglect towards baby Jack slash Ernest, who we end up discovering he actually is towards the end of the play. She loses him as a, as a child, and that we end up finding out, of course, that, that he is who he's been pretending to be all along. But I think also Miss Prism, also, you know, we use a prism as a, as a, a device of refraction, a way of taking the light and splitting it into its separate elements and being able to understand its composition through, through doing so, through an analytical effort. And I think there's a possibility that we look at her view of life as, as the wrong vision, her insistent sort of moralism as a warped version of ideological vision. I think, again, you know, it offers an interesting contrast with Stanley Weber and the birthday party, and also Blanche and Streetcar. Cecily's talking to Miss Prism about Jack at the bottom of the play. She says, Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he's so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. And so we have this, this accidental sort of register of, of Uncle Jack and his different versions of identity, that he seems so serious and grave when he is in the role of moral guardian to Cecily, that he seems ill, and yet, as we go on to see, he, he has a fabricated identity that allows him to express the kind of, the more impulsive and salacious elements of his character and his identity. This prism over the page, though, says, his gravity of demeanor is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is, I know of no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. So again, that sense of contrast with reality is importantly revealed through the way that they talk about him. So we've got this exposure of the duality of his identity and its hypocrisy, effectively, in the opening part of the act. Miss Prism says, Tesley, I'm surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and trivial and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate man's brother. Then, of course, this very deliberate, dramatic irony exposes the emptiness of severity. You know, that their, their forceful insistence on severe, tightly regulated morality and stern morality has already, in the previous scene, been exposed as a sham. And so I think that's, that, that stern sense of social orthodoxy is, is comparable to the way that Goldberg and McCann um, expose their own basis for rigid social codes and, and moral subordination as whimsical and full of, of sham itself. This prism further down then says, Indeed, I'm not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I'm not in favour of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. And I think here, there's an interesting potential contrast with Golden McCann. 
Goldberg and McCann, sorry, because you know that seems to function actually as the opposite declaration of of what they they are attempting in the play. That they're attempting in the play to convert someone that they have identified as bad and turning them good. But here is actually this sort of casual dismissal of the, the worthwhile nature of a morally upstanding citizen. But Goldberg and McCann are kind of sinister in their effort to do so, and that the morals that they attempt to convert them. Stanley into, or the, the vision that they attempt to convert Stanley into, is is one that itself is based on on a kind of hollow sense of performativity. In their discussion, Cecily says, "Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are! I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. They're talking about writing. They've both done. The good ended happily, and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. And so there is an element here." of self aestheticization you know, the, the, her famous three-volume novel that is being mocked throughout the play. And saying in, in, in doing so that, that the sense of resolution ultimately supports those who are morally driven and then criticizes those who are, are, are morally um, limited and so that aesthetic, in the end, is sort of revealed in part by the play itself. You know, that, that this is the way she sees life and the way she sees aestheticism. And the play, in the end, actually mirrors that idealism. And so there's, a, there's an interesting contrast with Blanche here, whose reality obviously runs in the opposite direction to her aestheticized ideal. And so we have this interesting contrast along those lines, where aestheticism in this play is actually providing the impetus and life ends up mirroring it as, as is part of Wilde's kind of mantra. Whereas in Streetcar, that, aesthetic, that aestheticized ideal is something that ends up being the source of Blanche's vulnerability. Cecily then says to Chasuble, how are you this morning, Miss Prism? You are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. And Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. So here there's, within Cecily's personality, is someone that is capable of being an aesthete because she is constructing this kind of symmetrical plot actually in the reality of the play. She is attempting to uh, formulate an aesthetic reality with. Uh, a romantic relationship between Miss Prism and Chasuble. At the bottom, Chasuble says, I hope, Cecily, you're not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. Oh, I am afraid I am. That's, that is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. And then she glares. I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from beads. So there's this sense of anxiety about the language that he tries to shift here of this, this, this metaphor, this sort of idiomatic metaphor that he's hanging upon Alphonse and his lips, hanging upon their every word, hanging upon, waiting for their opinion and their feedback or their ideas. And yet he sort of shifts this into something almost nonsensical. So language itself here, I think, is, is an anxious kind of vehicle for sexuality and that in some ways has to be regulated. And that's interesting, I think, in contrast with... Um, the birthday party, because there's a sort of authentic passion motivating language here that, that Chasuble, because he's a sort of moralist, is trying to regulate. Whereas in the birthday party, you know, the the, the passion that is registered, say, between Goldberg and, and Lulu is based on inauthentic language. And this inauthentic language shows us basically the, the inauthenticity of the experience itself. They talk further about language. Miss Prism says, I think, dear doctor, I'll, I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. So here, there's a kind of, I think, a sense of desire beneath the surface of these kind of polite mannerisms, these very affected uh, linguistic codes that is, is extremely comparable to street cut, you know, that there's this false insistence on geniality and chivalry. And yet there's a powerful sense of passion underneath it, or desire for human connection. But also desire under the elms, where you have this um, 
sense of desire lurking beneath the surface of the character's interactions, but in a much more intense, um, vengeful way. Miss Prison Letters, that would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee, you may admit, is somewhat too sensational. Even these metallic problems have their melodramatic side. And so here, she suggests that there's actually something wrong with prosaic, prosaic rea well, insisting on sorry, prosaic reality because of the melodrama of something that is actually part of that reality. We think of you know political economy and the economic um, shift in the value of currencies being part of that materialist prosaic reality, and yet at this point in time, Miss Prism mistrusts it because it is hysterical and associated with aesthetic perception. And this, I think, is comparable to um, Stanley Kowalski's kind of relentless sort of concrete materialism in Streetcar. 